Good morning and welcome to Spring Valley Church. Would you all stand and greet one another this morning? season of Christmas and the season of Advent is about hope and peace. Jesus, as the Prince of Peace, did not come to end all of the wars and suffering in the world, but to give us peace from our sinfulness. As we light the second candle, we remember that it is only through Jesus that we are able to have real peace. Amen. Well, as we uh, start our morning in worship, we're going to continue this celebration of the Advent season with a new song. So uh, if you can pull that chorus up to this first song, uh, I'd like to teach you before we jump right in. It goes like this. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. This 
and uh, kind of get caught up on, on the more details than what I can share now. But I do have a few announcements to share with you today. One is that you've seen the big Christmas tree in the center of the hub. We call that the giving tree. And that is to benefit Hand to Hand and Matthew's House Ministries, two mission organizations that we've been supporting for a long time here at Spring Valley Church. Uh, there's tags on there you can take that have different descriptors of things that are needed, food items, donations, etc. So I just want to encourage you to take some time to maybe as a family pick out a, a little um, call it an ornament or two off of that tree and uh, consider um, supporting those ministries in that way. Just a little something extra, a way that we can step up during this time. The 50 plus group is going to be doing a special uh, carol sing on December 17th. And they want to make sure that everybody knows that you don't have to be 50 or plus 50 to attend this. Uh, everybody is welcome. It's at one o'clock and you can talk to me. Eden, she has a beautiful green coat on today. Uh, she's, I'm looking right at her. So you can uh, connect with her if you've got any questions about that. Um, Next week is a special Sunday, every Sunday is special, but next Sunday is special for the fact that it is our children's Christmas program. So uh, we want to encourage you to make sure you come back next week and support the little kiddos and the work that they've been doing and preparing a special part of our service next week. So that's just a reminder, next week is the children's Christmas program. And then on the 19th of December, we're having our special um, program for the rest of us, I guess. Uh, it's going to be our candles and carols and candlelight service. That's an evening, special evening worship gathering. It'll happen at 6.30 at night. We uh, sing a lot of great old hymns and some new Christmas songs. Uh, so we just want to encourage you to put that on your calendar and come out for that night. And then a new thing has evolved this week that I'm happy to share. A new idea in, in line with uh, what was shared several months ago now about kind of working out of your passion, coming up with ideas for new ministry things and new ways for helping our congregation to grow closer, all that kind of good stuff. And that is that we are going to have a Christmas movie night. It's during the week that the kids are off of school. So the week of December, uh, well, the date is Wednesday, December 22nd. And we're going to be uh, watching the movie Elf, which Come on, who doesn't love Elf, right? What a great movie. So it's rated PG, so keep that in your consideration. Um, it's pretty pretty safe. But uh, the movie's going to start at 7. The doors will open at 6.30. There will be uh, pizza available by donation and other concessions for sale. But the popcorn is free. So free popcorn, just that will be enough to get all you Dutch people back here in church, right? Free, free something, just the word free. So uh, look, put that on your calendar as well. December 22, movie night, everybody welcome. And just a time to get together and hang out and enjoy the, the season. And then one final new date to share that isn't going to be on the screen behind me. Um, we've been sharing a little bit about some changes going on with our denomination and how that affects us and so forth. And the fact that we are going to have some informational meetings concerning that. Uh, so the first date that I just want to throw out to all of you is we felt like the, the most effective way to get the most people to come to that or that are the most available would be after a morning worship service with the holidays upon us with all the special stuff going on. The first good Sunday to do that is January 9. So on January 9, after our worship gathering, we'll come back into the sanctuary and do a, a, a Q&A and an informational type meeting. And then between then and the end of the month, we'll host as many meetings as needed that we feel are needed to have more of those Q&A sessions, probably during the week, a weeknight or something to that effect. But the big one, the first one put on your calendar is, is Sunday, January 9th, okay? All right, should we pray? Thank you, yes. All right, let's do that, let's pray. Our dear Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, Lord. We, um, we are in anxious anticipation of this Advent season, which is a season of anticipation in itself, knowing that um, we have arrived but have not fully arrived, that you have come but yet will come again. Lord, we pray that this morning uh, we can leave behind the worries of the world, the troubles, the, the things that plague our hearts and plague our minds, and allow us to simply be 
Um, help us to be engulfed by your Holy Spirit this morning, that we might not only seek its presence in our heart, but that we would, in a very real way, know it's there, that we would, um, that we would entrust it this morning, that you would just simply bless this time, the rest of the time that we have here today, that you would um, use it for uh, transformation and molding and, and the, the using of your will to be made full in us. Lord, we, we ask that you would bless the, the words that are spoken. We would ask that you would bless the the, the offering that's giving, that you would bless the, the worship and the singing that happens, the, the fellowship, every element of this time today, Lord, we, we just commit it to you. We pray that you would be pleased with it. Uh, Lord, we, we also uh, pray as we anticipate at the end of our service today, a time of holy communion. Lord, we know that um, uh, our responsibility in approaching the table of, of, of grace is that our, our hearts would be made right with you. And so, Lord, we confess to you at this time our sin. Uh, we know, Lord, that on a daily basis we fall short of your glory, that, that we do things um, uh, on a regular schedule that, um, that we ought not to do. And, Lord, in our efforts of, of discipleship, of, of growing in the faith, we desire to, to walk away and to leave those things, yet um, we are also... Uh, affected by the reality of sin in, in our world and in our personal lives. So, Lord, um, clean us, we pray. Clean our hearts. Um, uh, Lord, help us uh, to, to approach this table later this morning um, with, with, a, with a clear and clean heart. Lord, we thank you for your grace that makes that possible, that the forgiveness of sins that's represented in this very act of communion is only possible because of the work that you did on our behalf. So Lord, we commit this to you, we commit all these things to you. And Lord, we want to pray for uh, the people of this world who are hurting and lonely in desperate ways. We think of the horrible shooting that occurred earlier this week at Oxford, and Lord, we, we pray for those families of the lost people, um, the lives that were lost. We, we pray for the, the families that are affected by it. Lord, we, we pray for Floyd Forner, who um, is in hospice care and, and declining readily, steadily, um, Lord, and being prepared to, to enter into your gates, um, to be welcomed home to you as Heavenly Father. Lord, we, we pray for and just all the, the many needs and hurts and pains that are going on in not only our congregation, but our world, Lord. We realize that um, we are but human, but that you are God. And so, Lord, in that trust and in that faithfulness, we pray that you meet us and that you, you teach us and that you show us today. We pray all these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so we are in this series of Advent. Started last week and for the next couple of weeks. And uh, I want to continue on this sort of theme and idea this morning about uh, add that being about waiting and about patience and, and all that sort of thing. And, and I'm actually going to preach my Christmas passage, you know, it's supposed to be Christmas messages this time of year, from a, a book of the Bible that's not considered very Christmassy. Uh, Second Peter uh, is the, the, the book I'm going to re read from today. If you want to turn in your Bible, uh, I'm going to be reading from the third chapter of Second Peter this morning. And uh, let me start just at, at verse 1 for you today. He says, This is my second letter to you, dear friends, and in both of them I have tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. I want you to remember what the Holy Prophet said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commanded through your prophets. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. This is what the scoffers are saying. Where's Jesus? Thought he was supposed to come again. They deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command. And he brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. 
Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by that same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. You must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for you. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. For the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away into the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heaven and the new earth, as he promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. I want to ask you a question, the question of the day, really. It's pretty short, but it's this. What would you like to be doing when Christ returns? You ever thought about that before? Uh, Assuming most of you this morning are people who believe that there's a day when Jesus will return, have you ever pondered what you will be doing at that very moment? But more specifically, the question I'm asking you is what would you like to be doing? In other words, What would you like to have Christ find you doing when that moment happens? Uh, I understand the the heart of what Peter is getting at here is both a sense of a congregation that is at unrest because these false teachers have entered in and they're they're convincing people that it's it's not really true. Where where where's this Jesus? He's supposed to come back. Nothing's really changed and feeding them uh, down a different road, a different path. And so his his concern is to to try to uh, help them be reminded of God's past, of who he really is. He's the one who actually created the earth. He can can bring up water from a word and he can use that water to to transform the nation and bring the nation back and speak of the power. But beyond that, Peter's also reminding them that Look, we have no idea. A day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day. Uh, It's not on our timetable for the second advent. Uh, It's not on our timetable for Christ's return. It's it's not on our timetable for anything that God chooses to do. It's it's always God's timetable. And God's timetable is so incredibly different than ours. A day is like a thousand, thousands like a day. It just speaks to the to the, the chasm of difference in our understanding of humanity's time and God's time. But that being said, that being true, Peter's concern is to live a certain way. To to be ready because it's going to come like a like a thief in the night you know lately although i'm going to retract that it's not really lately because i think my whole ministerial life what i'm about to say has been happening 
I run into a feller here or there. You know, I have a conversation with a lady over there, whatever the case may be. And on a very, very regular basis, I hear a phrase that goes something like this. Boy, it sure looks like things are going to be ending soon, don't it? I wouldn't be surprised if Christ comes back any minute. Which is really a comment about the way society is going that the perception is that things are just getting so bad in this world that surely this is getting really, really close to those end times, to the, to the day of judgment. And on one hand, I, I can't dispute that. I mean, I agree with that. Things keep getting, more bad things keep happening. There's no doubt about that. We just saw it this week. But again, it, it it's been happening throughout all of history. It's been happening since the fall of Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. And what Peter is concerned about are not so much those signs of the time as he is the fact that you're ready. That, that you're living a certain kind of life because nobody knows the time or the day of the second advent. A year is a thousand, a thousand is a year. Where are we at in the midst of that? We're in the same last days that, that Peter was in. But he's pretty clear here to, to say that since everything around us is going to be destroyed, what holy and godly lives you should live. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along what holy and godly lives you should live. What would, what would you like to be doing when Christ returns? Would, would you like to, to be on a street corner sharing your faith to somebody who has no idea who Jesus is? Would, would you like to be working at a mission, um, feeding starving mouths? Would you like to be uh, uh, at the bank uh, transferring money into some, some important ministry somewhere? Would you be like to be on your knees at your child's bedside praying uh, that they would come to know this Jesus someday? What would you like to be doing when the next Christmas happens? Are you spending more time building other stuff and other things, uh, more, more so than striving to develop a Christ-like character. Do you, do you spend more time preparing for the next Christmas than, than preparing for earthly life, of having more and finding more, more stuff and things of that nature? This Advent season, we've been talking about the difficulty of patience and, and, and of, of waiting. This idea is really rooted in the word hope, that, that we can have patience because we know there's, there's a future hope that, that is coming. But I wonder, um, I wonder if you put that hope in, in looking at what God has done faithfully or put that hope in... It's something totally different. The hope of things that you achieve, things that, that you strive for. So in the Hebrew, there's these two different words for hope. Uh, yakal, which simply means to wait for, and kava, which means uh, it's, it's related to this word cord. And the word picture out of this Hebrew word is this idea of that when you pull on a cord, that you pull and this tension is created with uh, this anticipation for something to happen of, of a release. So it's this, this constant sort of um, waiting and expectation. And for the, the people uh, of Old Testament uh, Bible characters are constantly living in this wait, this expectation of, of God to come, of God to show up, of God to be there. 
uh, they, they recognize that it's not based on the evidence of their present situation, but of the history of, of what God has done in their people's lives. God's past faithfulness nourishes hope for their future. So this morning, uh, you know, I, 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 I try to sort of, you know, give you the, the coach's pep talk of, hey, let's live holier lives. Let's go out there and get them. Let's, let's put away the sin. Let's just, let's just do better. And I know that the reality is that lasts maybe, you know, like maybe to the parking lot, right? Because before you get there, your kids, one little boy hits his little brother, and then, you know, you realize that somebody's coming over for dinner and you forgot to put something in the oven, and life, life happens, right? Life just happens, and holiness begins to shrink down and different modes take over in our lives. But this idea of, of a holy life has to go beyond just the, the current circumstance, and it has to look into the past faithfulness of God and, and, and what he's done. You look forward by looking backward, trusting in nothing other than God's character. The reality of your circumstances, the reality of whatever it is you're going through, isn't what matters. As much as God's character and his faithfulness, not only in your life, but in the generations of God's people that came before us. Biblical hope isn't like optimism in the sense of optimism is based on the odds, the possibilities. Biblical hope is based on the person, the person of Jesus Christ, the work that he's already done gives us the hope for what he will do. Christian hope looks back to the risen Christ in order to look forward. So in this season of waiting, in this season of hope, we look backward to the risen Christ in a little while, we'll, we'll be reminded again of, of the significance of what that was all about by looking at the cup and the bread. Tim Keller, a great author and preacher, says this about God's timing. He says, you cannot judge God by your calendar. God may appear to be slow, but he never forgets his promises. He may be seen to be working very slowly or even to be forgetting his promises, but when his promises come true, and they will come true, they always burst the banks of what you imagine. God's grace virtually never operates on our time frame, on a schedule that we would consider reasonable. So for those of you this morning who are grown weary of the wait, hang in there. It's not our time schedule, it's not our time frame, but God's faithfulness is trustworthy. It's shown to be trusting all you have in, in that reality. Um, this morning, I want to close this time by sharing uh, uh, a character in the Christmas story that maybe we don't tend to think of a whole lot, but um, this character certainly would have had to struggle with God's timing, God's faithfulness, God's work in the greater, grander story. So I'm going to introduce a new part of my preaching is called Pastor Rob's Story Time. And uh, forgive me for uh, you know reading a little bit more than just an illustration, but a very but a short a short story to you this morning. But I think uh, I think you'll find it good. So this story is called The Night in the Stable.
And it reads like this. Matthew describes Jesus as earthly father as a craftsman. A small town carpenter, he lives in Nazareth. The single camel dot on the edge of boredom. Is he the right choice? Does God have better options? An eloquent priest from Jerusalem or a scholar from the Pharisees? Why Joseph? A major part of the answer lies in his reputation. He gets it, he gets it to, up for Jesus. Then Joseph, Mary's husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public uh, example, was minded to put her away secretly. With that phrase, a, a just man, Matthew recognizes the status of Joseph. Nazareth viewed him as we might view an elder or a deacon or a Bible class teacher. Joseph likely took pride in his standing, but Mary's announcement jeopardized it. I'm pregnant. Now what? His fiance is blemished, tainted. He is righteous, godly. On the one hand, he has the law. On the other, he has his love. The law says stone her. Love says forgive her. Joseph is caught in the middle. Then comes the angel. Mary's growing belly gives no cause for concern, but reason to rejoice. She carries the Son of God in her womb. The angel announces, but who would believe it? A bead of sweat forms beneath Joseph's, Joseph's beard. He faces a dilemma. Make up a lie and preserve his place in the community, or tell the truth and kiss his reputation goodbye. He makes his decision. Joseph took to him his wife and did not know her still. She had brought forth her firstborn son. Joseph swapped his Torah studies for a pregnant fiance and an illegitimate son and made the big decision of discipleship. He placed God's plan ahead of his own, which makes, which makes uh, me think about not holes and snapshots and I wonders. You'll find them in every chapter of the Bible about every person, but nothing stirs so many questions as does the birth of Christ. Characters appear and disappear before we can ask them anything. The innkeeper, too busy to welcome God, did, did he ever learn who he turned away? The shepherds, did they ever hum the song the angels sung? The wise men who followed the star, what was it like to worship a toddler? And Joseph, especially Joseph. I've got questions for Joseph. Did you and Jesus ever arm wrestle? Did he ever let you win? <coughs> Did you ever look up from your prayers and see Jesus listening? How do you say Jesus in Egyptian? Whatever happened to the wise men? Whatever happened to you? We don't know what happened to Joseph. His role uh, uh, in an act is so crucial that we expect in this act is so crucial we expect him to see him the rest of the drama, but with the expectation of a short scene, exception of a short scene, uh, when Jesus is 12 years old in Jerusalem, he never appears. The rest of his life is left up to speculation, and we are left with our questions. But of all my questions, my first would be about Bethlehem. I'd like to know about the night in the stable. I can picture Joseph there. Moonlight pastures, stars twinkle above, Bethlehem sparkles in the distance, and there he is, pacing outside the stable. What was he thinking while Jesus was being born? What was on his mind while Mary was giving birth? He'd done all he could do. He heated the water, prepared a place for Mary to lie, he made Mary as comfortable as she could be in a barn, and then he stepped out. She'd asked to be alone, and Joseph has never felt more so himself. And that eternity between his wife's dismal and Jesus' arrival, what was he thinking? He walked into the night and looked into the stars. Did he pray? For some reason, I don't see him silent. I see Joseph animated, pacing, head shaking one minute, fist shaking the next. This isn't what I had in mind. I wonder what he said. This isn't the way I planned it, God. Not at all. My child being born and stable. This isn't the way I thought it would be. Cave with sheep and donkeys, hay and straw. My wife giving birth with only the stars to hear her pain. 
This isn't at all what I imagined. No, I imagined family, I imagined grandmothers, I imagined neighbors clustered outside the door and friends standing at my side. I imagined the house erupting with the first cry of the infant, slaps on the back, loud laughter, jubilation. That's how I thought it would be. The midwife, uh, the midwife would have uh, had me and my child and all the people would applaud. Mary would rest and we would celebrate. All of Nazareth would celebrate. But now, now look. Nazareth is five days journey away and here we are in a sheep pasture who will celebrate with us the sheep the shepherds the stars this doesn't seem right what kind of husband am I I provide no wet midwife to aid my wife no bed to rest her back no pillow my her pillow is a blanket for my donkey uh, uh, my house for her is a shed of hay and straw. The smell is bad. The animals are loud. Why, I even smell like a shepherd myself. Did I miss something, God? Did I, God? When you sent the angels and spoke, the Son of Being was born. This isn't what I pictured. I envisioned Jerusalem, the temple, the priests, and the people gathered to watch a pageant, perhaps, a parade, a banquet, at least. I mean, this is the Messiah. Or if not born in Jerusalem, how about Nazareth? Wouldn't Nazareth have been better? At least there I could have my house and my business. Out here, what do I do? What do I have? A weary meal, a stack of firewood, a pot of warm water. This is not the way I wanted it to be. This is not what I wanted for my son. Oh my, I, I did it again. I did it again, didn't I, Father? I, I don't mean to do that. It's just that I, I forget. He, he's not my son. He's yours. The child is yours. The plan is yours. The idea is yours. And forgive me for asking, but is this, is this how God enters the world? The coming of the angel, I've accepted. The questions people ask about the pregnancy, I can tolerate. The trip to Bethlehem, fine. But why a birth in a stable, God? Any minute now, Mary will give birth. Not to a child, but to a Messiah. Not to an infant, but to God. That's what the angel said. That's what Eric Mary believes. And God, my God, that's what I want to believe too. But surely you can understand. It's not easy. It seems so, so, so bizarre. I'm unaccustomed to such strangeness, God. I'm a carpenter. I make things fit. I square off the edges. I follow the plumb line. I measure twice before I cut once. Surprises are not a friend of a builder. I like to know the plan. I like to see the plan before I begin. But this time, I'm not the builder, am I? This time, I'm a tool, a hammer in your grip, a nail between your fingers, a chisel in your hands. The project is yours, not mine. I guess it's foolish of me to question you. Forgive my struggling. Trust doesn't come easy to me, God. But you never said it would be easy, did you? One final thing, Father. The angel you sent, any chance you could send another? If not an angel, maybe a person. I don't know. Anyone around here and in some company would be nice. Maybe the innkeeper or a traveler, even a shepherd would do. I wonder, did Joseph ever pray such a prayer? I had to share that story because I thought it brought such imagery to what that man might have gone through. And in what he might have gone through, I think there are pieces of what we all go through. At the very common denominator of this piece. Why God? Why? Why me? Why my kid? Why my family? Why to my neighbor? Why is this happening? Why? Not the way I want it, not the way I imagined it, not the way it makes sense in my mind. Why? Why a child like this at a time like this? Our hope 
is it based on our rational thinking of what makes the most sense of what seems to be the best time. Our hope is based on the work and character of God and what he promises will happen, will happen. This morning, as you wait for Christmas to come, as you wait for Christmas to come again, may you have hope. May you have the hope that what Christ has done, he will do and fill to completion. Our Heavenly Father, we, uh, we struggle when things don't go our way. We struggle in our faith, we struggle in our relationships, we struggle in ourselves. And so Lord, today, would you instill within us not just the encouragement to live a more holy life, but rather a, a sureness of your promise. Lord, we look forward to the anticipation that the day when you return and remove all sin and evil from this world. Lord, we look forward to that glorious day. And we pray that we would live lives that honor you in a hopeful expectation of Jesus. Amen. transition here from what feels like Christmas to Easter in a lot of ways. Normally we uh, connect the dots to communion with the events of Easter. But the reality is that the hope of Easter arrived the day of Christmas, the day of Christ's appearance. And so while we wait in hopeful anticipation, it is good for us to come together and be reminded of the blood and the body of Christ that changes everything, that answers so much of the why God. If you are a visitor here and you're unfamiliar with communion or unfamiliar with um, uh, this, whole, this whole thing, um, we understand the Bible to teach that uh, there's kind of two responsibilities revolving around communion. The first is that you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you're a part of the family of God in that respect. And the second one is that um, each of us individually have a responsibility that when we come to this table, we do so with pure hearts, that we, we, we come in a, 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 a sense of, of forgiveness, asking God to forgive us for the sin that's in our lives. So uh, if those two things are apparent in your life, you are encouraged to come to this table. Uh, we'll have four different stations set up, and each station will have bread that's gluten-free and not gluten-free, um, and we'll have uh, the little the, uh, individual cups for you to have as well. So we just ask that um, you come when you're ready, and uh, you partake of the elements at that time. It was on the night when Christ was betrayed, that after he had given thanks, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And as often as you do this, do so in remembrance of me. And at the end of the night, when it's time for the final cup of wine, he took it and said, this now represents a new covenant, a covenant made in my blood. And as often as you do this, do so in remembrance of me. If the elders and servers will come forward, we'll begin serving communion in just a moment.
Amen. Hey, go out this week. Be reminded of the real hope that you have in this Christ child, this baby born to us. Heaven come to earth. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide in you now and forevermore. Go in peace. Amen.